Okay, so is that now working? Great. Uh, so thank you very much, and thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me to come and give these lectures. It's a great pleasure to be here. I have very fond memories of coming to a school and workshop quite like this a few years ago uh, that was really useful, so it's great to be back. And I'm going to be telling you about something that's a little bit outside of perhaps the main thrust of this school. So I'm not really talking about quantum information or those sorts of things. But another aspect of uh, modern uh, advanced quantum science, which we hope is also taking us on a path towards some future quantum technologies. Uh, so the organizers have asked that I divide up my lectures in order to first give you a bit of an introduction two topological phases of matter, because that's not being covered elsewhere in this school. So the first two lectures are going to be from quite a traditional condensed matter perspective about what is a topological phase of matter, what types of topological phases of matter do we know about and are interested in, and give you some examples of the toy models that we use to see these topological effects. And then in the third lecture, I'm going to move on to how we realize topological phases of matter using cold atoms, and in the fourth lecture, how we do this with photons. And I will hope to convince you that there are very good reasons why we should be trying to do this with cold atoms and with photons, and how this can help us learn more about these topological phases of matter, but also have some quite interesting possible applications and reach some new regimes that we haven't been able to see with just solid state materials. OK, so as with all the lectures today, do feel free to ask questions as we go through. Um, we also, I think, have the question time at the end of the afternoon, so do come and ask more then. And I've also already uh, put my slides up on the website. So the slides will have a lot of references on them because I want to give you all of the resources you need if you want to go and find out more. So uh, don't worry about writing all of the references down. These are all available on the website. Uh, so you can check there. OK, so let's start with this uh, topological phases of matter. And the key references. As promised, here's the long list for the first two lectures. So I just want to show you a couple of my favorite references. In particular, the seminal example of a topological phase of matter, as we'll see, is a quantum Hall effect. Uh, and the classic uh, quantum Hall effect book is this one. But also, there have been these very recent lecture notes uh, by David Tonk Cambridge, which are a wonderful introduction to quantum Hall physics and fractional quantum Hall physics. Um, topological phases of matter is a very new field and as such has also uh, spawned quite a few very recent reviews. Uh, so in particular, these are the two classic reviews on topological phases, uh, topological insulators and topological superconductors. Um, oh, sorry, this one and this one. This is Berry phase effects and this one is a very recent one about classification of topological phases as we'll come on to. And I just want to mention we have uh, probably the first textbook of the field, which is this book by Bernevig, which is well worth it if you want to get your hands into the research. It's got lots of examples, lots of questions. And there's also an excellent online course that you can do. So it has all of the questions and tutorials uh, that is accessible here. So as I say, all of this is available on my slides, on the website, so you don't have to write it down. But those are some great references for everything that I'll be talking about in the next two lectures. Uh, and then I'll give you more references as we move on to the cold atoms and to the photons. So what is topology? Let's just start with the very basic idea of topology that we get from mathematics. And for instance, we can talk about uh, topology is a way to classify different types of surfaces. So this is an example that I'm sure many of you have seen before, which is how can we tell whether an orange is different from a donut? And the idea is that these surfaces, regardless of the local geometrical details, are characterized by a global topological invariant. And in this case, that invariant is the genus. It is the number of holes that this surface has. 
And so this is a little animation that I stole from Wikipedia, which is showing you that as you take this coffee mug and you deform it into a donut, you're keeping the number of holes the same. And that means that this surface has always got the same topological class. It always has a genus equals one, even though you're twisting and uh, smoothly deforming it. So the idea is that in mathematics, we have uh, sometimes got these global properties. They are integers, which is one of the reasons they're so robust, because you can't change an integer continuously. You have to do something dramatic You've got to tear a new hole in order to get from one genus to another genus. Um, and these are properties that can be used to classify different surfaces. Now, what about physics? Standing here as physicists, then what really started this idea of can we do these same sorts of topological phases, but now with uh, solid state systems was beginning, beginning with the discovery, the experimental discovery of the quantum Hall effect in the early 80s. And uh, this was discovered by uh, Klaus von Klitzing and others, and he won the Nobel Prize in 1985 for realizing that when you take a cold quasi-dimensional 2D electron system and you change the magnetic field uh, that you're putting perpendicular to the surface and you uh, measure injecting currents and measuring the Hall voltage, so the voltage perpendicular to the current that you inject, that you see these amazingly robust plateaus in the Hall resistance. So the Hall resistance being related to the Hall voltage and the current in this way. And these plateaus are incredible because they are quantized uh, very, very robustly and precisely as h over e squared with an integer and this integer n. And this precision is so good that this is becoming our best definition of electrical resistance and h over e squared. That's so robust. And it doesn't depend on the details of all the geometry of the sample. If you have a sample with disorder, it's still robust. Um, and this really posed the mystery of why. How can we get something that is this robust? And it was... Uh, Thaulis, David Thaulis and others who showed uh, shortly after this experimental discovery that the reason this is such a robust phenomenon is because this is the first example that we know of a topological phase of matter. And you probably heard about this in the news because this was, of course, part of the Nobel Prize in 2016. Uh, so I was very excited about that, especially because it meant there were popular science articles that I could give to my parents so that they had some hope of understanding what I do. It didn't really work, but at least it uh, gave a bit more incentive to this field um, and brought a bit more of a highlight. But this is just the first example. What we realized since the early 80s is that topological phases of matter are actually a very, very broad class of systems. And it's actually a whole other way to understand and classify different phases of matter. So the phases of matter as you learn them in undergraduate physics in most universities, is that we have uh, this paradigm of spontaneously broken symmetry, for instance. So you can think of the difference between a disordered magnet where the spins are pointing everywhere, and then as you cool it down or as you change other parameters, you go through the uh, transition and the spins align and to get a ferromagnet. And so that's an example of, in the disordered state, you have a local order parameter like the magnetization, which is zero. And then as you go through the transition, you have that local order parameter taking a non-zero value. So we can say that in that paradigm, different phases of matter are characterized by different values of that local order parameter and a spontaneously broken symmetry. Now, topological phases of matter are also very distinct phases of matter, but do not fit into this paradigm. Because we don't have local order parameters, we have global topological invariants, in analogy to that genus that I was talking about a moment ago. And I'll tell you some more about the topological invariants. And we also can't think about the spontaneous symmetry breaking in the same way. We can't think about 
if we uh, see a system that spontaneously breaks a particular symmetry, then that's the topological phase. It doesn't work like that. Symmetry is important, but plays quite a different role. So it's another paradigm of phases of matter, but one that is generating an awful lot of richness, as we'll see through these lectures. Oh, have I skipped a slide? No, I think that's... OK, yes. So why am I standing here? Well, from my title, I'm not talking about electrons, really. I'm actually a photonics and cold atom person. So uh, I personally work on topological phases in photons and cold atoms because we have much greater controllability and tunability of those systems. So it's a wonderful playground for engineering different Hamiltonians that we really want to see the topological properties of. And also, I'm excited about how we can use the cold atoms and photons to explore new things that weren't possible with just electrons and solids. And this is going to be the focus of lecture three and lecture four. And I also want to say, I feel like I should situate myself within the school, because it's maybe not so obvious where I fit in. But this is a very exciting area that's getting a lot of attention at the moment. And it's very useful because it's showing us how we can use the cold atoms and photons to simulate, to do quantum simulation of interesting effects. And also, there's this hope that maybe some of the stuff will have some practical applications. So what is topological in a phase of matter? OK, the shorter answer is the wave function. We're talking about the topology of the wave function. The more precise answer for these lectures is I'm going to be talking about topological band theory. So that means that I'm really limiting myself to systems where we can talk about the single particle energy bands of a system. So typically, we're talking in the first two lectures, just think about electrons moving in a solid. So we have electrons in a periodic potential. And through Bloch's theorem, we know that the uh, electron wave function can be decomposed into the plane wave and the periodic block function. And those periodic block functions uh, have got uh, satisfied the black block Hamiltonian and the energy bands. So we can plot them in the Brillouin zone in this way. And I'm interested in the topology of those eigenstates, those block states here, and how those block states vary over the energy band and what topology we can assign to that. I'll talk more in detail about this, of course. But here's just an example of a topological uh, system where, a, with each energy band, we can associate an integer. Uh, this is called churn number. There are other possibilities. Uh, and I'll talk a lot more about churn numbers, so don't worry. But the idea is that these eigenstates taken together as an energy band have got some topological properties. Now, when is this good? Well, this is good for many, many topological phases of matter that we're interested in. So, yeah. Sorry? Um, it's actually, so it's the same. In this particular model, this is actually a harper hofstadt model with flux equals one fourth. So it's got this, it's actually got a symmetry between the top and the bottom. So the bands look actually the same. So in this case, they've got the same topology, uh, the top band and the bottom band. Yeah. Which is a characteristic just of this model. Uh, okay. So this, and this is also an example of a particular model which will show the quantum Hall effect. So I'll introduce this later. Uh, so integer quantum Hall effect can be understood with this single band, uh, independent energy band theory approach, as can topological insulators. So, OK, I'm using uh, terminology, which means that I say topological insulator for time reversal invariant topological phases in a way that I will define later. Some people in the field use topological insulator to mean top everything, including quantum Hall systems, but I'm going to be a slightly different with that terminology, just to warn you. But it should be clear as we go through. And the other thing that we can talk about is, uh, strictly speaking, when we don't have these uh, electron energy bands, but when these are quasi-particle bands. So if we're talking about the topology of, for instance, quasi-particles in a superconductor or a superfluid, that also fits within this particular paradigm. 
Now, what topological band theory cannot do is it cannot tell you about systems where really strong interactions are important. So, for instance, fractional quantum Hall physics, uh, we cannot describe just using uh, the single electron picture all the time. Um, and that's very interesting, and that's a whole other talk in itself. The reason that I have chosen to focus on the topological band theory is because that's where the fields of cold atoms and photons currently is. We're at the stage in cold atoms and photons that we're really good at getting topological bands that are single particle energy bands, but we can't yet do the strongly correlated topological physics. That's what we'd like to do, but we're not there yet. So to help you understand the state of the art, this is the way that I'm structuring this talk. So within topological band theory, we have bands. But what does it mean to say a band is topological? And how can we say that this band has got a different topology to some other band? Well, a very useful concept is that of topological equivalence, which is saying that we can define two bands as being topologically equivalent if we can smoothly deform one band into the other band without changing, uh, without closing the band gap. And this is crucial. Um, so this is just a schematic of what I mean by this. This is taking the same model that I showed you before. Uh, so it's the Hofstadter model. And in this particular case, there's a parameter. Don't worry about these uh, uh, details, but just think there is some parameter of the Hamiltonian that I'm tuning. And as I tune this, I can go from a system which is topologically trivial to a system which is topologically non-trivial. And the only way that this can happen is if at the point where uh, the transition occurs, uh, which is corresponding to, uh, sorry, this uh, projector I don't think is shown. Let me just see. OK, so I'm afraid this is a little bit hard to see. But this picture here corresponds to, in this regime, this picture here corresponds to exactly at this transition. You can see all this on the slides online, so check there if you're uh, not sure. And at this point, the gaps close. So you can see that, that here now we have these band touching points. And that is required for the topology to change. OK? And this is part of what we mean by topological robustness. Because anything that we're doing to a band, as long as we're not closing that energy gap, is preserving the topology of the eigenstates. So that's one of the central ideas. And that's one of the reasons why topological physics is so interesting, because it's very, very robust. Because if you add perturbations, if you add stuff to your system that changes the band structure a little bit, provided you don't do something so dramatic that you close the band gap, your topology stays the same. Any physical quantities that depend on that topology will stay the same. Um, here, I'm, so here, for instance, I'm talking about the topology of the single band. So if you, in, if you were to, when you want to assign a topological invariant, you could assign it to this band on its own, or you could assign it to a group of bands, and then that topological invariant would uh, not change even if you had band gap closings within the group of bands that you selected. So you can choose... Basically, you're choosing how much of your spectrum you want to group together. Here, I'm grouping together uh, this band. OK, technically, here I have two bands, so I've grouped those two bands together. Um, and here, I can have band gap closings within these two bands. Um, but because the topology I'm talking about is as that as a unit, that's OK. Then the topology of the lowest band is always a topology Yes, so we'll come on to that. Uh, so that is the, top OK, this is where the word topology has two meanings. So that means the topology of the parameter space in terms of how uh, the block states are connected to the other block states. But then we can talk about the topology of the eigenstates themselves, so how those eigenstates change. And that's the topology that I'm assigning this index to here. So in, in, yes, so in some sense, the because of the, the periodic boundary conditions, it's always a torus. But how those eigenstates are actually winding on that torus is what I'm calling this topological index. I'll show you some more examples later. Yeah. What's the rule of band gap? So band gap is uh, 
is crucial in the sense of the band gap is what is protecting the topology. So when the band gap is going to zero, then you will see, for instance, with the topological properties that I define, that that's the point where you can get a topological transition between two topological states. So as long as the band gap stays open, I'm in one topological phase. Was there another question? Yeah. <laughs> no, that's a very good point. It is not a chance at all. So um, you can show that the sum of the Chern numbers over the whole system have to add up to zero. Uh, that is a fundamental property of the, of the Chern numbers. In a, yeah. So that is not a chance at all. It's a symmetry. We can talk more about it later. OK. So. Another point that arises from this, which is one of the reasons why people love topology, is because I just said that the band gap is crucial. So open band gap can be in a topological phase. And then at this band gap closing, we can have the bulk topology of the band changing. So uh, here, for instance, the lowest band has topological uh, index chair number 0, and here it is 1. And at the point where we get the transition from one to the other, the band gap closes. Now, you can turn this around. Here, I plotted this as a function of the tuning parameter. But what if now I had uh, a topological material next to a vacuum? So an interface between a topological material and a vacuum. Then the vacuum would be like it was on this side. And the topological index, the topological material would be like it was on this side. And what I've just shown you, and you would be able to see perfectly if the slide had come out well, is that at this point here, the band gap closed, because we had to have the band gap closing to have the transition. And that means there must be gapless modes confined to boundaries of topological materials. So because between non-topological and topological, so topological and the vacuum, we have to have the band gap closing means there will always be gapless modes at the surface of a topological material. And we'll see that this is one of the reasons we really love topological physics, because those gapless modes can be very, very special. And that's called the bulk boundary correspondence, just to say. It's much deeper mathematically, but I'm not going to go into that. Now, I did say that symmetry played a role. So what is the role that symmetry plays? Well, it is a guiding principle for us. Um, so we want to be thinking about what kinds of symmetries are possible in our system, and that will allow us to talk about what types of topology are possible, what types of topological phases of matter are possible. Um, and so in a moment, I'm going to show you the classification table. But firstly, I just want to say, so we can obviously think about crystals that have certain spatial symmetries, so certain types of reflection or glide symmetries or rotation symmetries. And those are great. They give us extra constraints that can also lead to interesting things. But those are not very uh, generic. Those are very easy to break. You know, you add a defect, and you can easily break a reflection symmetry. So what we tend to do is we tend to ignore these symmetries, at least at the lowest level, as not being so interesting, and focus on the most generic symmetries that we can possibly have in a quantum system. And the most generic symmetries that we can have are time reversal symmetry and particle hole symmetry. So time reversal symmetry, uh, you can just think of, OK, so what does time reversal symmetry do? Well, it's like reversing the direction of time. So for instance, if we have a Hamiltonian as a function of momenta, it should flip the momenta. But the system should remain unvariant under this. And this time reversal operator um, is an anti-unitary operator that reverses, that we will define for particular models, but that is going to reverse the direction of time in our system. Another generic symmetry that we can have is particle hole symmetry. And so we'll see this particularly for, for instance, systems like superconductors. And we have whole classes of topological superconductors that have particle hole symmetry. And so that's saying that the symmetry of uh, having a particle is related to if you, you can either add an extra particle or you could take out a hole. Uh, you could add a hole and take out. So 
Then we also have combination of the particle hole and the time reversal symmetry, which we call the chiral symmetry. And between them, these symmetries are the most generic things that we can think about. And what they have done, very uh, recently starting from 2009, is classify what possible topological phases of matter are possible. So here, I am not deriving this, I'm afraid, because deri deriving this is very, very complicated. Uh, but these are references where you can find everything discussed in much more detail. But I want to use this as the structure for the discussion that we're going to have. So we're interested in these kind of generic symmetries, and we're going to be talking about different examples from this table. So what really am I talking about here? So first off, let's look at the symmetry table. So this is called sometimes the tenfold way, because these are the ten possible symmetries that we can have with those uh, time reversal, particle hole, and chiral. Now, you can show that time reversal symmetry operation, if you have t being the time reversal operator, that t squared has to be plus or minus 1. Uh, come and ask me afterwards if you want to know more details about that. But that means for time reversal symmetry, we have three options. We can have plus 1, 0, and minus 1. And next lecture, I'll show you an example of plus 1 and minus 1. And zero means it's broken. Particle hole, we have the same three options, because we also have to have that p squared equals plus or minus 1. So we have zero plus or minus 1 here, zero plus or minus 1 here, and then chiral is a product of time reversal and particle hole, and that just gives us one extra class on top of the other nine. So these are uh, the generic uh, symmetry classes, and then According to the dimensionality, this is the table of topological invariants possible for the fermions. And I love this because this, to me, is a bit like a periodic table is to a chemist. I look at this table to see where am I, what is possible. So if you have, an, if you have for instance, a system that has none of these symmetries and you're in dimension three, then you look here and you see it's zero. And that tells you straight away you can't have a robust topological invariant in that type of system. If instead you're in dimension two, you see Z, and that says you can. You can have an integer topological invariant. And this is just, I should say, for the non-interacting fermionic Hamiltonians with these types of symmetries. We can also consider adding back in those spatial symmetries. Uh, we can also consider classifying defects. And we can also say something about gapless systems, but I'm not going to say anything about that. And so this is what people kind of are referring to when they're talking about topological phases of matter. It's this table and what we can explore within it. But be careful, because just because there is an entry in that table that says Z or Z2, it doesn't mean that you're always going to be in a topological phase when you're in that symmetry class because zero is a perfectly fine topological invariant, and zero means it's topologically trivial. So this is why it's very different to the spontaneous symmetry breaking paradigm, because just because we're in a particular symmetry class does not mean we are guaranteed to have non-trivial topology. We actually do have to calculate and check and see what our system is doing. So why is the symmetry important at all? Well, it tells us where to look. You know, so straight off, I can say, if you have no symmetries and you're in three dimensions, there is nothing topological in a robust sense. You maybe could add some extra reflection symmetry and get something kind of topological, but it's not really robust. You can break it really easily. But also, it tells us, within a particular symmetry class, what kinds of things can we do to that system and keep it topological. So if we have a topology that relies on time reversal invariants, and we add some magnetic impurities that break time reversal invariants, OK, our topology's gone. You know, it's not robust. So this tells us what we can do while keeping that topological class. And now I want to get to what I'm actually going to tell you about. So I can't tell you about all of those classes, but I'm going to tell you about some of the most important entries in this table. And in particular, I'm going to focus uh, the rest of today 
and probably a bit of next time, on the quantum Hall class. So quantum Hall classes are in the first row, so they break time reversal invariance. So we saw that already because we were talking about quantum Hall effects of a 2D electron system in a magnetic field. And a magnetic field, an external magnetic field, breaks time reversal symmetry because it, it forces electrons to be chiral and that you can't reverse without reversing the sign of the magnetic field. So that's breaking time reversal symmetry. They also don't have any of these other generic symmetries, so we're in this class A. And one of the reasons that we love this class so much and I spend so much time on it is because it, if you want to talk about cool things that you could do, applications, it's actually kind of the most interesting class because it's really, really robust because I've already broken all my symmetries, which means all the perturbations I add are going to stay within that symmetry class. Now, the other things I do want to talk about are a bit about topological insulators. So they're a bit like class A, but now with a time reversal symmetry. And this is what really sparked off this explosion in the field in 2005, was the discovery of these topological insulators, uh, theoretically, the theoretical prediction and understanding of them. As I say, if you add some magnetic impurities, then you can break these. So I don't like them as much, but they're very, very beautiful. Then there's also, uh, in particular, some other classes that I'll talk about, the SSH model, just very briefly. And these classes here, which you can see have got particle hole symmetry. And so that means we're talking about topological superconductors. And those are very cool because, as we'll see, they can have uh, modes in them that are Majorana modes that people are interested in because of their interesting non-abelian properties and statistics. So that takes us in the direction towards topological quantum computing. OK, so I apologize for not having derived this table, but this is a picture to have in your mind of a plethora of possibilities. And now let's dive in and see what a particular example of a topological phase actually means. So the 2D quantum Hall effect, let's go back to this. Uh, so just to recap what I said before, we have a system where we can have these plateaus in the Hall resistance. And this is an integer. And this integer we're going to show is related to the sum over the occupied churn numbers of bands. So I'm going to define for you what a churn number is. I'm going to talk about how we get them. Um, and this churn number leads to this robust behavior. And as we said, it's very robust because this is a very robust topological class. We can add disorder to the system. We can do crazy stuff to the system. As long as we don't close those band gaps, then uh, or the band gap at the Fermi energy in this case is the crucial one. As long as we don't close that, we're going to have the same topological behavior. And also, I said something about this bulk boundary correspondence about the gapless modes. And one of the reasons we love quantum Hall is because the gapless modes are actually one-way propagating chiral edge states in this case, which means that uh, at the edge of the system, we have a, an edge state that connects the valence band and the connection band that is only in one direction, so as a group velocity uh, that, for instance, in this case, is always positive um, and connecting the two bands. So classically, you can understand this because classically, if we have these electrons, which are charged particles, moving in a magnetic field, in the bulk of the system, they're doing closed cyclotron orbits. But at the edge of the system, we can see something special can happen because as an electron tries to do a cyclotron orbit, it's bouncing off the edge of the system. It skips along the bottom. And the quantum version of this are these chiral edge states that come through the bulk boundary correspondence. So what is a Chern number? How do we get to a Chern number? Well, I'm going to uh, take a step back and introduce it through something called the Berry phase. And one of the reasons I've chosen to do this is because this way of understanding the Chern number has really uh, inspired a lot of the work in cold atoms and photonics, as we'll see in a little bit. So what is a Berry phase? As we'll see, Berry phase is very intimately related to these topological properties. Now, we're considering just a Hamiltonian that depends on a set of parameters. So R1, R2, R3, doesn't really matter what they are. 
These could be external fields. Um, uh, for instance, it could, we could be talking about a spin in a magnetic field, and this could be the direction of that magnetic field. Now, what I'm going to consider is I'm going to consider the case where we have, we know the normalized non-degenerate eigenstates of this system. You can generalize this, you can talk about degeneracies, but it complicates things too much for what I want to present here. So we just have this Hamiltonian, and these are the eigenstates, N of R. Now we ask ourselves, what happens if we take a state prepared at N with at R at time equals zero, so N of R zero, and we evolve it under adiabatic variation of the parameters? So I just said these states are non-degenerate, which means that we have an energy gap. And this is one of the ways that the energy gap is going to come in and play a role. And now we adiabatically evolve it within that lowest eigenstate, which means that we're not including uh, the possibility that the state could transition. So if we evolve it, it's got to stay in the same state, of course, at a different point in the parameter space, and then up to the possibility of having a phase factor. OK, that's all it can do. And we know how to treat adiabatic quantum evolution. We can plug this into the Schrodinger equation. So IH bar d by dt of this state has got to be the Hamiltonian with this time dependence on that state. But if you just plug this in, you can see that you have two ways that this d by dt can act on the state you're putting in. It can bring down this phase. It can be d theta by dt or it can act directly on that eigenstate, because that is also a time-dependent eigenstate. And on the other side, on the right-hand side, you're just getting the energy back out because you acted with the Hamiltonian. Now I uh, multiply from the right by n, by the same eigenstate, and I use that these are normalized orthogonal eigenstates such that on this side, multiplying by n is just giving me this h bar d theta by dt. Here, I, of course, just have the en. And I've taken this over to the other side now, where I keep, uh, I change the sign because it's over on the other side, the n d by dt n. OK, so I've just taken this simple idea, plugged it into the Schrodinger equation, and said, let's see what happens. Well, that's a differential equation that I can solve. I can integrate that with respect to time. And my phase, this phase, I don't know what it is, is got to be the integral over time of the energy as a function uh, dt prime. So en r of t prime dt prime. And then this quantity here, which is telling us about how the eigenstate is changing. So what does this mean? Well, the first part you should all recognize it's just the dynamical phase. That's just the dynamical phase uh, that we always get in quantum mechanics. So an eigenstate evolves with e to the i e t over h bar. The other part is something that you may or may not have seen in your undergraduate course. And this part is what I'm most interested in. This is going to be the Berry phase. So you can see that we have this differentiation with respect to t prime. So it's telling us about how those eigenstates are changing. But to make it a bit clearer, let's just change the variables to get out that uh, time dependence. So now instead, we differentiate with respect to the parameter r. And now outside, we have a dr by dt prime. OK. So and then very roughly, using physics uh, mathematics, then we see that what we end up with is a phase that depends on how the parameters change. So it's only depending on the contour that we took in that parameter space, not on the explicit time dependence. So it doesn't matter if we went fast or we went slow. It just matters where we went. And this is why we call it a geometrical phase, because it only depends on where we went in parameter space, not on dynamically how fast we went. OK, so actually, people knew this a long, long time ago. Like, this is really something that you can write down right from the beginning of quantum mechanics back in the 1920s. 
But people thought, ah, well, this doesn't really matter because in quantum mechanics, we have gauge freedom. We can, we're free to choose the gauge of our eigenstates. So if we change that gauge, um, that means that we can multiply our eigenstates by a parameter-dependent phase factor. What happens to that Berry phase? Well, this is an extra phase factor that we now have here that we put into this, and we can see we get the same state, uh, the same expression, but now we also have this gradient of the gauge that we chose, that gauge function. And so if we just integrate that, then you can see that if we choose these two bits of the gauge function correctly, then surely we should always be able to cancel out that Berry phase. So how can this be an important physical quantity? Because it's gauge dependent. We just choose that chi at the end of our evolution and the chi at the beginning of the evolution so that we cancel this out. And that's what they thought. They just thought, well, this we can always make go away so it can't be physical. And it took until Michael Berry in the 1980s to say, wait a second, what if I don't consider just any evolution, but I consider evolution that goes in a circle, that's a closed evolution, where my starting and finishing point is the same thing? Well, then I actually have a problem because I said that I was going to choose this gauge and I decided I wanted to choose a smooth gauge, and a gauge that led to a single definition of my eigenstates everywhere. But now, this condition, the fact that I want this e to the i chi at, of r at t to be the same as e to the i chi of r at zero, I want those two factors to be the same in order to have the same uh, definition, that, to have my eigenstate single uh, valued within this gauge, that means that this difference between these two things has to be 2 to pi times an integer. I've lost the ability to choose the gauge in order to get rid of that Berry phase. And that means that the Berry phase is physical and gauge invariant, modulo 2 pi, for a closed contour. So it's not always gauge invariant. We only really talk about Berry phases that are associated with these closed contours. That's already great. And this is a new aspect of quantum mechanics that we'll see is very, very important. And actually, of course, is much wider than the narrow uh, consequences and topological phases of matter that I'm going to be talking about today. So I don't have that long left, which is OK, because I, I might have been going slowly, but I'm doing about the pace I wanted to do. So this is good. Um, so how do we think about this Berry phase? Well, one of the things that I always like to picture in my head is parallel transport of a vector. So, oh, yeah, sorry. That's zero. Oh, sorry, this is not the Berry. So the Berry phase itself, it, this is just the, the, the gauge function. It's the gauge function condition. So it's that the Berry phase is gauge invariant up to 2 pi. Yes? No, no, no. You have to do a closed contour. And then you can get the gauge. So once you do a, a closed contour, you can have the Berry phase itself being equal to anything. It's just that if you were to change the gauge, you could get a 2 pi addition to that that would actually be the same physical thing, which you can see as well because it's a phase factor. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So I was just talking about this analogy with... Uh, so this is how I like to visualize it. So if you think about parallel transport of a vector, that means that uh, we take a surface and we move a vector according to um, particular mathematical rules, on a closed contour, and then we look when we come back to the same point whether that vector has rotated. And actually, one thing we know is that if we have a flat system, a system with no Gaussian curvature, then that vector will not rotate. 
But if we have a system that has some curvature, for instance, a sphere, then that vector does undergo a rotation. And that rotation is related, actually, to the solid angle that is enclosed. It's related to the Gaussian curvature of the surface. And what we're doing here is kind of a bit like parallel transport. We're actually doing a version of parallel transport, but as is defined uh, for eigenstates and the associated fiber bundles. So mathematically, the maths is more involved, but this is a, a good basic analogy. If you want to, I think in the next slide I have, okay, in a few slides then I will have a reference to Nakahara's geometry and topology in physics, which is a great reference that talks about these ideas of the, uh, the fiber bundle and how this is related. But this is the picture that I have in mind. And that inspires us to introduce some other concepts. So just like that Gaussian curvature that led to a rotation of the vector, we can talk about a Berry curvature that leads to this Berry phase. OK, so what am I actually doing here? I'm just taking the expression for the Berry phase, and I'm saying, let's call this part of the integrand uh, something called a Berry connection. So you know the Berry phase is this, but I'm going to take this part of it and call it a Berry connection, which is telling us basically the parallel transport condition. And that is related to a curvature. So just as we could integrate the Gaussian curvature to get the rotation of the vector, so we can think about integrating this Berry curvature to get the Berry phase. And these are very nice subsidiary concepts to introduce, as we shall see. One of the important things to note is that this Berry connection is actually gauge dependent. So it's a really, really tricksy thing. You don't want to spend too much time talking about Berry connections because they can be deceiving. But the Berry curvature is lovely because it is fully gauge invariant. As you can see by just plugging in what a gauge transformation does into these quantities. And one of the things that is very, very powerful, uh, in particular in cold atoms, is this idea that Actually, we can make a beautiful analogy here as well with magnetism. So this Berry phase is a phase that we get when we do this close contour. And that is very similar to the phase that we would get, uh, the aronoff bohm phase, if we encircle a certain amount of magnetic flux. So you can think about the Berry phase as being a measure of how much flux of this uh, magnetic flux is through this contour you can think about the Berry connection as being like a magnetic vector potential. Magnetic vector potential is also gauge dependent. So it, the analogy is very deep here, as we'll see. And you can think about this Berry curvature as being like a magnetic field. Um, so these are some very, very useful concepts. And now we're going to see how we can push this uh, one step further. And that is to make the connection now back to topology. So everything I just told you about uh, was geometrical, because you can see that what I'm talking about are local properties of this parameter space. I'm not talking about a global topological invariant yet. I'm talking about the local properties. So what about global topology? Well, in mathematics, there's also a uh, connection between local geometry and global topology, which is the gauss bonnet theorem. And that is, uh, as stated here, that the integral of the, Berry, of the Gaussian curvature over a closed surface is related to the genus of that surface. So this is the topological invariant of surfaces that we met earlier in this talk. And actually, we have the analogy here, which is that the integral of the Berry curvature over a closed surface is a topological invariant, an integer called the first churn number. OK, so I'm technically at the end of my time. So I can leave the derivation of exactly why this is and why this is an invariant uh, to next time. Uh, but yeah, this will be the subject then of where we'll pick up tomorrow. It will be how do we see that integrating the Berry curvature over a closed surface has to give us an integer? And then how do we see that that integer um, is the first churn number of those energy bands that I talked about at the beginning. Okay, thank you very much.